right. So uh, I can't see you. I don't know how many of you there are, but uh, I heard that there's a, a good-sized uh, group there. Um, so Chad asked me to answer a few questions uh, about Google and WebRTC. In particular, he asked me to, to answer the questions of why Google's working on WebRTC and where Google uses WebRTC and what's coming up next for WebRTC. And I'm thankful for the uh, opportunity and, and uh, thanks to him and Nils for getting us together and letting me join remotely. Um, so to start off, answering the question of why is Google working on WebRTC, um, it's basically to bring a state-of-the-art real-time communication ecosystem into the 21st century. And he, Chad did a great job of, of describing uh, all of the different applications. The web is such an important part of the ecosystem. So with WebRTC, the, the ecosystem is quite large. And also, and as you can see, for a very wide range of applications, you know, only only two of these involve, or three of these involve video, the other two are just data. And um, only one of these is really a classic video chat that you might um, think of as real-time communication. The others are are kind of new use cases. So um, then I, the next question that Chad asked me to cover was, what comes next? And to cover what comes next, we have to cover like what's happened most recently. So in 2014, there's been a lot of progress. Uh, the, the the, not only is the implementation maturing, but also the standard is, is maturing. And it's headed close to a 1.0. And that'll be a critical milestone where um, the ecosystem will be able to build up on a, on a more stable footing. Right now, uh, over the last year or two, you know, the, the standard changes from time to time. And so those who are um, working with it are kind of on the cutting edge and, and uh, it shifts a little bit here and there. But once we hit the 1.0, which is very, which is getting much closer, um, it'll be a, a good stable foundation for everyone. We've also integrated a lot of uh, feedback from application developers over the last year, in particular, um, being able to change the camera from front to back on a mobile device and being able to control the audio output device that is used, for example, with a Bluetooth headset. And in, in a bigger case, we've taken um, the, the feedback from application developers about how the API should look. And some of those application developers even went and started a different uh, community group within the W3C, so a little different uh, standards group within the bigger standards body. And uh, they called that ORTC, and they had some ideas for how the API could be better. And uh, we at Google felt like there was a lot of potential here, so we joined the community group, and we, we contributed a lot of input into how we think that a future API could look uh, after the 1.0 is done, sort of a 1.1 API. And we think that that effort was very successful. We, we've come up uh, with, a, with a very good-looking API, and we've even been able to take pieces of that API integrate them back into the 1.0, making the 1.0 API significantly better. And um, Internet Explorer likes the, the new API, the ORTC API so much that that's what they're, they've committed to building into um, Internet Explorer. The good news is that we designed it from the beginning to be backwards compatible with the WebRTC 1.0 API, meaning that with some JavaScript library on top of ORTC, it'll be completely compatible with the rest of the ecosystem. It's not like there's this uh, separate um, ecosystem. It's one ecosystem just with a more low-level or uh, slightly cleaner API that is compatible with the rest. So that's been a lot of good progress in the last year on that front. On the front of applications, there have been a lot of, launched in the last year, uh, Hangouts in particular as far as Google is concerned, um, but uh, others, other very popular applications have also launched. Uh, so for example, Snapchat added um, video to their um, application, and Cisco launched Project Squared, which uh, is, I, I'm not entirely sure what the relationship to WebEx is, but it's this uh, project to make enterprise class communication for uh, built around WebRTC. And similarly, there's been a pattern lately of new startups creating new real-time communication applications and getting a lot of hype and um, doing really cool new innovative things. And the pattern is basically that these all use WebRTC. And Taco and, is even going to be presenting a little bit later today about what they're doing. And um, it's really great to see startups be able to enter the ecosystem with a new idea of how real-time communication work that might be not what the classic video call or audio call is, and 
um, be able to, to use all of this technology that has come out from WebRTC. That is precisely what Google's vision of the ecosystem or part of the vision of the ecosystem that we want to see. So we're really glad to see these sorts of things happening. Uh, some of the goodies that have happened in 2014, I think by goodies, I mean like uh, improvements in the implementation are that number one, we've made Android and iOS a first class target for our, the work that we're doing. And the uh, support for building Android and iOS applications is significantly better now than it was a year ago, and it's going to keep getting better. Uh, another one is that Opus has now been implemented and is the default audio codec. It's a fantastic audio codec, really the state of the art, almost the uh, audio codec and all audio codecs. And it, um, it's what you get when you, when you use WebRTC. It's fantastic. And Opus has built in uh, what's called FEC, and there's also FEC for video. Uh, FEC stands for forward error correction. And out of the box, just by default, you, you set up and run a WebRTC call, and you get forward error correction, which gives you um, really, good, really good quality, even when, when the network has uh, significant packet loss. And finally, over the last year, we've had, added significantly uh, improved support for hardware encoders. So similar story to FEC and Opus. Um, you get better quality and with um, improved battery life and as long as the hardware supports it and you don't have to do anything. It's just an improvement that gets built in. If you're uh, using the uh, web platform, then you just load your latest JavaScript on the latest browser and you get it for free. And if you're running a native app, you just compile the latest version of the, the library into it and you get it for free. And it, this is a story that's going to continue in the future. So stuff that's coming up in the future um, are that uh, we're finishing the 1.0 API, which I which I mentioned uh, how important that is. Uh, the next version of video codecs is uh, VP9. It's the successor to VP8, and it has a lot of really great features for real-time communication. The WebRTC team gave a lot of feedback to the team that does VP8 and VP9, and we we had a, you know, said, okay, here are the things that would be fantastic for real-time communication video codec. And they basically went and added all of them. And some of them are, are really fantastic. And uh, on top of that, VP9 gives um, basically um, twice the, or 50%, 50, 50 to 100% better quality for the same bit rate or uh, half to uh, three quarters of the bit rate for the same quality. Something somewhere in there, I, um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's a significant improvement in quality for the same bit rate and a significant uh, reduction of bitrate if you keep the same quality, all, again, for free. You just compile in the latest library. And uh, in many cases, it even has better battery life since the radio on a mobile device, since the radio is being used less with, with fewer bits. Um, what's coming up next, again, the uh, API continues to improve. We continue to take pieces of what's the work that's been done in ORTC and pull it into the uh, Web, WebRTC working group. And so the API is going to continue to get better. There'll be more. Uh, control points for more advanced JavaScript applications. And the mobile support is going to keep getting better. Uh, like I said, we've made it uh, Android and iOS first class targets uh, for our work. And um, now we're going the next step and going to be improving how well uh, WebRTC works in mobile networks and mobile uh, or with network mobility when you have mobile devices. I think um, Taco and some of uh, the, the talk that they have uh, mentioned some of the problems they ran into, and we hope that uh, in the future that won't be a problem as we improve the stack. Um, one question, you know, I, I was answering why and where and what. Uh, another question might be when. You know, when is WebRTC going to happen? Sometimes people ask us that, and the answer is basically it happened. Uh, we already have a whole lot, a whole ecosystem, and lots of people are using it. It's mature. It's progressing. It's widely in use. It's more than just the web. It's more than just an API. It's this great ecosystem, and it's just going to keep on getting better. But it's here already. You can use it already. Uh, so I want to take a few minutes with the time I have to do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, this is going to be different than the rest of the presentation I've done so far. If you are, um, if you're interested, and I hope you are, I hope you're interested in making a WebRTC application or service. Uh, after seeing all of uh, the other presentations also along with mine. And um, I want to provide a few details about what's actually in the stack underneath the API so that as you 
if you choose to build an application or service, you understand what parts are going underneath. And this is, I think, very important for when you are debugging things when they go wrong or when you want to improve certain parts of it and you're wondering what's working well and what's not to know what the pieces are. Uh, especially as you grow more familiar with WebRTC as you use it and you uh, decide you want more refined control uh, over the different components. So uh, at the very highest level, if we start up with you know, the high level view and then work our way down, um, what the library or the API gives you is that if you can accomplish just one slow text round trip through the cloud from one end of the internet to the other, let's say you have two mobile phones or a mobile phone and a web browser, uh, if you can just get those two to communicate with one text message and back, one round trip, then WebRTC basically does all of this magic. And at the end, what you get is a direct connection between the two that's secure, robust, and low latency. It can deliver audio, video, and data. And it's very flexible and very powerful. And all of that magic in between is really taken care of for you. Except that there are a few things that you need to understand uh, that you need to take care of in that one slow text round trip. Because under some circumstances, it might be more than just one. Uh, and you need to know what it is that you're going to be putting in that, uh, that text round trip. And it helps a lot to know what those packets at the, between the two are, are, are going to be. So um, as Chad mentioned earlier, there's uh, if we have this stack uh, of interaction, at the top you can see there would be your application. And it communicates with the API over what's called SDP. And so basically this text goes back and forth between you and the peer connection. So what happens underneath the peer connection? That's where it gets interesting. And it's important to know that there are four main components under the peer connection. And these are acronyms that you really want to get familiar with if you're going to be working uh, with real-time communication. They are ICE, and we're kind of working from the bottom up here, ICE, DTLS, RTP, and SCTP. And there's a little bit of overlap between RTP and DTLS, which is why the boxes overlap. But, Here's how it works. <clears throat> Your app does this round trip with the text message, and that's called signaling. And then step two, which is at the bottom, is that ICE makes a connection between the two endpoints. So the job of ICE is to make a connection on the internet between, between two endpoints. And it sounds like this should be simple because that's what the internet was built to do. But because of the way the internet has evolved, especially with NATs and firewalls, it's just not that simple. It's actually very complex. But that complexity is mostly hidden from you. You don't have to worry about it, except when dealing with uh, signaling and then, and, and then with debugging. So it's really important for you to know that um, ICE handles this connectivity and that throughout the call, there will be continual uh, pings from one side to the other um, to keep this connection alive. So after the con connectivity is made, the DTLS layer secures the connection. and DTLS uh, is basically the state of the art, or you can use the state of the art crypto to ensure that this connection is secure and encrypted and can't be um, uh, tampered with or uh, spied on or whatever. Um, it's as secure and, and as basically as you can get. Um, once, it, once that uh, has taken place and the DTLS layer has secured the connection, then Steps four and five, which actually can happen in parallel, are that you want to deliver audio and video and you want to deliver data. Audio and video go over RTP, and basically the audio and video are compressed and then broken up into packets, which are um, then sent over the wire. And in the case of SCTP, the data is broken up into packets and sent over the wire. With SCTP, there's reliability added and congestion control, whereas with RTP, it's a little more, um, uh, there's no reliability and uh, the uh, congestion control story is a little more complex. But it's important to know that there are basically four um, uh, separate streams of packets going uh, potentially across the network for ICE, DTLS, RTP, and SCTP. So if, we make, if I make a diagram that shows kind of the flow of how packets uh, go, on one hand, on, the, on one side, you'll have, for example, um, your signaling hand over data to ICE and DTLS. And then those make the pack or send packets to the other side to get the connectivity and, and to encrypt it. 
The other side also has to have the signaling fed to it. And that it's your job to make those two ends of the signaling blocks uh, communicate with each other. But once they do, then the magic can happen between ICE and DTLS. Meanwhile, if you plug in a data source, basically a data channel that's sending messages into the SCTP layer, the SCTP layer will uh, put the SCTP packet inside of a DTLS packet and then send it over the DTLS, over the DTLS uh, connection. Meanwhile, uh, your camera and mic can feed into an RTP um, component and RTP actually sends its own packets not encapsulated in DTLS and it, it kind of in parallel with ICE and DTLS. And then once those RTP packets are received, they're uh, decrypted and decoded and play out on a speaker or a screen. So that's a lot of detail at once, uh, but what, what you can get away from this is that there are four main uh, components, ICE, DTLS, SCTP, and RTP. And um, two of those are, are for getting a connection and, and encrypting the connection. And then the other two are for um, delivering data and audio and video. And that the data ones are actually encapsulated inside of DTLS, but the RTP ones aren't. So I don't know how relevant that is going to be to you, but maybe someday you open up Wireshark, you need to look inside the packets going over the wire. <clears throat> so um, that's kind of the deep dive. I, I hope that was valuable. Um, if you have any questions, you can save them for later. But there is one last topic that I wanted to cover that I, I, I kind of want to I kind of hope that uh, people will understand it is kind of important. So let's say that you get all of this set up and you have this one to one, one, -to -one call um, that's doing audio, video, and data. It's doing something great in your application. Um, and a little bit later down the road, you, you decide, okay, wouldn't it be great if we had three people communicating with, communicating with each other, or maybe even four? And <clears throat> you think, okay, the one way I could accomplish this is by having each uh, endpoint send its audio, video, and data to all the others in sort of this uh, box that's in the middle. We call this a full mesh, where everybody sends everybody everything. And this kind of works uh, for audio with, with a fair number of uh, endpoints. And even with video, if everyone has really good bandwidth, you can get up to two or three or maybe four uh, or maybe more. Uh, but eventually, you're going to run out of bandwidth, and this isn't going to scale very well. So a very common uh, solution is that you put something in the middle, and that's what we see on the right, which is uh, you put this, this server in the middle, sometimes called an MCU, sometimes called an SFU, sometimes called a middle box, whatever. And what it does is it basically, you send it your audio and video and data once, and it sends it to everybody else. And it sort of pays the bandwidth cost, uh, or it has more bandwidth than perhaps the uh, mobile device on the, that sending originally has. And this is a very common solution. Uh, for this problem to do multi-way video. And when I talked earlier about the reason I bring this up is twofold. Number one, so that it's so that you understand when it comes in the point in time when you want to scale your application to, to multiple people communicating at the same time, you understand that this is going to be a problem and that either you're going to implement your own uh, kind of MCU, MCU solution, which is hard, or you're going to go and uh, find somebody else to solve this for you. And... Um, so hopefully that will help you kind of avoid uh, a dead end in, in going down the full mesh route when it won't uh, meet your expectations. A second reason that I, I bring this up is because uh, this way you can understand better the, the reasons behind something like VP9. So VP9 is adding um, the ability for a codec to send uh, multiple resolutions uh, in kind of at once. And th that allows um, something like an MCU to receive um, different resolutions from a sending client and then send out to different receiving clients different resolutions depending on how much bandwidth they have available. And without this kind of multiple resolutions at once solution, um, it's just not possible to, uh, to implement this kind of solution in a good way. And VP9 uh, has very good support for this, this kind of thing. So um, the, the WebRTC stack is improving in the sense that it's adding a lot more capability for solving this problem. And um, my hope is that uh, just like there are lots of frameworks building up around providing um, uh, all of the, the signaling or the turn uh, or other solutions that, that build a framework to make WebRTC easier, I hope that in the future there will also be people where they provide an MCU that you can work with and that everybody will be able to use uh, multi-way video. 
So that's a little bit of details around that, one of the, the common um, roadblocks that people run into and how it can be addressed and how the, the, the framework and the, the API is improving to allow for this. Um, I guess one last uh, bit here uh, that I wanted to point out. Now that you understand uh, that there are these components underneath Peer Connection, RTP, SCTB, DTLS, and ICE, um, now you can understand what the difference is between ORTC and, uh, or WebRTC 1.1 and the current WebRTC 1.0. And it's basically that currently the application speaks to the Peer Connection through text, and then that text is interpreted by the Peer Connection as a way to control the RTP, SCTB, DTLS, and ICE components. But in the 1.1 or the ORTC API, um, these components are controlled directly by the application. There are JavaScript methods that you call and you pass in JavaScript objects, and that's how you control them directly. So in one sense, it, it does uh, require a little bit more understanding of how the things work. So in the, in the very most simple use cases, it's a little more complex. But on the other hand, when you want to do very complex things, um, or advanced things, it's a lot easier to work directly with the components. And the reason we wanted, or that we did the work to add this is because of all the application developers that were running into roadblocks uh, working with um, uh, advanced use cases. So this is a, another instance of um, the API improving over time to allow uh, for more advanced use cases. So for more info, uh, you can go on all the things that Chad had. Uh, he has a lot of great links. Um, I, I like this link, from which, which was an I.O. presentation made last year um, about WebRTC, and it has further links to learn more about uh, WebRTC. So uh, that's it for me. I hope everybody could hear me the whole time. I didn't actually have any feedback. Yeah, no, so. Thanks, uh, Peter. That was great. Um, <laughs> really appreciate you uh, exposing everyone to the full extent of WebRTC at Google and uh, you know, all the protection. Practitioners here are, are certainly very appreciative of what Google's done to really change the real-time communications industry and, and continues to really uh, push ahead. Does uh, we are running a little bit late on behind, uh, you know, behind the timer as I expect we'll continue to do. But uh, does anyone have any quick questions for Peter? Hopefully you can hear me okay, right, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. But any, anyone have any any questions they'd like to ask? So, uh, did you hear that, Peter? The, the question was, does RTP have its own encryption? And maybe you can, you can elaborate on how uh, RTP is encrypted. Yes, uh, RTP is encrypted with what's called SRTP. And uh, basically, um, there's a footer. Uh, the payload is encrypted, not the headers. And then there's a footer um, to do uh, method, uh, message uh, um, uh, uh, verification that it's not tampered with. So uh, yes, RTP basically has its own. That's why there's that little overlap between the DTLS box and the RTP box. Uh, so basically what happens is after DTLS uh, secures the, the connection, uh, it kind of passes the crypto keys over to the RTP layer, and then RTP encrypts itself from then on. All right. One last question for, for Peter. I can't, I can't hear. So, so the, the, the question was, uh, with the current uh, implementation, you can see the IP address in JavaScript. And there's a question of, uh, is, is there a plan to address that? Uh, you mean the IP address of the local network? Is that what you mean? Uh, of, of the remote party. Uh, there is a microphone there, too, if you'd like to use it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the remote party. OK, so uh, this is kind of up to the application. Um, the discretion of the application. So basically, the uh, application can specify whether the IP address of the remote party is made known to the local. Um, and one thing, they c if, if the application doesn't want this to happen, then one thing it can do is um, say, oh, uh, specify that it will only use turn, which is, um, it means that there's a server going to be in the middle to relay the traffic between the two. And so there is a way for the application to say, I only want to use turn, and I don't want the IP address to be. Uh, I don't want the two parties to know each other's IP address. Essentially. Great. All right. Thanks, Peter.